So hi, and welcome to the latest ESIS podcast. My name is Josh, um, and I am a transformation lead at East Suffolk and North Essex Foundation Trust. I'm also pleased to be joined by a great colleague of mine, uh, Debbie Edgell. Debbie, did you want to introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Debbie Edgell. I'm a regional business manager for services um, in ECL, Essex Cares Limited, um, and I support the reablement service for North East Essex um, and support ESNEFT as part of the community reablement and our ward-led enablement programme. Thank you. Um, and today we're going to be talking about the ward-led enablement programme, which has been an innovative health and social care way of working recognised through the ESIST Recondition the Nation movement. So that moves firstly, I suppose, we'll get the conversation going. Um, Debbie, where did the idea for ward-led enablement come from? Well, back in 2019, um, a service manager actually from Essex County Council did a ward visit and um, went and spoke to a patient who uh, didn't know what day it was, lost track of days, didn't know how long she'd been there. Um, and the conversation started around that time with PJ paralysis being very um, heavily nationally publicised around looking at maybe reablement differently, looking at the false environment of a hospital for a person when they're in there, they're unwell, they're in a bed, often sitting out in a chair, everything happens in a three metre space. Whereas at home, you've got rooms that you walk between, you go from your bedroom to your lounge, you go into your kitchen, um, and you tend to do more things for yourself. So the um, service manager from within the council asked me, would I be interested in doing a test and learn, test a theory, find out a new way of working and see if it would work. So um, we scoped it out. And in 2020, we started a um, six month test and learn pilot uh, with yourselves at the ESNEFT um, Colchester site. Um, that Obviously, 2020 was our COVID year, but throughout that time, we um, used the six months to prove that the theory actually did work. The concept of getting people up and moving um, it was a resounding success, but due to the height of COVID, it didn't go any further than the actual six month uh, pilot time. Um, a few months later, though, things started to settle down. And in 2021, uh, the Alliance and the ICB um, realised the impact the service had actually had and put um, a reserve pot of money for 12 months to continue with the um, programme and to reintroduce it back into the Colchester Hospital, which uh, started again in October um, of last year, 2022. So we're um, currently on two wards. Um, the idea is to get people up and moving to be dressed um, in their own clothes, if possible, to do things in the right room. So rather than using bedside um, equipment for going to the bathroom, actually go to the bathroom to do that, to uh, move arms, legs, even when sitting down, to sit out in their chair, to eat, preferably at a table if possible. Uh, if the person requires mobility aids to support them um, in practicing how to use those mobility aids in advance of going home, to have the conversation continuously um, in their minds about how would you do this when you get home? What is your home like? And to give people the confidence of going home and that they will cope when they get there. Um, this does seem to have had quite a real um, impact into the culture for the patients as to how they think about their hospital stay and think about the transition home, but also the staff um, and how they manage patients on the wards. So, Josh, have you noticed much of an improvement or change on the wards? Um in simple, massively. Um, this could be subjectively speaking, but also on a qualitative and quantitative basis. I think we learned a lot of lessons, didn't we, Debbie, from the initial pilot programme. We we're obviously quite disheartened when that unfortunately did come to an end, but it was a very complex period in health and social care regardless. However, I think that did give us that crux, that foundation, didn't it, the basis to really move on this. Um, the staff feedback from this and all elements has been nothing but positive. I mean, the patient feedback, you know, from the end of, of working through the reagent period, but also working with us on the ward has just been fantastic. They love the ladies in red, which is their nickname, as we know now, that has just grown with the service. But also something we didn't really take into consideration on reflection is that continuity of care as well. They support that patient's transition back into home. And, you know, that that's something that we've never been able to do. We try our best to create this seamless you know, transition from the acute to home, but it can be a very tra traumatic journey in hospital. So therefore having that familiarity, those um, people that sit on the ward, meeting them at home to reintegrate them back to home like, makes it much easier. How you capture that, we don't know, apart from obviously from the feedback and, and from what the colleagues are stating. But to me, that's been really quite pivotal. 
delving a bit more deeper into the specifics around health and the benefits we've seen in the acute setting, we found that higher percentage of patients on average are out of bed and dressed in their own clothing. Now, for me, it doesn't completely define what deconditioning looks like, but if we were to compare this to the evidence base around how extended bed rest can be detrimental to patients' health, whether this is infection, pressure areas, uh, accelerated weakening, sarcopenia, for example, it certainly gives us a bit more of an understanding or at least a snapshot of how maybe mobile, how more we're thinking about getting these patients up and dressed. Plus the simplicity of it is really quite important to be able to enable buy-in from our colleagues to complete it. Um, and obviously the patients to see the benefits from that as well. When we consider things like harm-free care, the evidence that we've established demonstrates a reduction in hospital acquired pressure areas. So when we extended onto the second ward in this example, we found within the first two months that pressure areas or hospital acquired pressure areas had completely significantly dropped, which again is definitely more of a physiological parameter, I suppose, in, in the effects of extended bed rest. Um, however, what we've found, even looking at falls, you know, I had a great discussion with our falls lead that said if we're trying to promote more activity on the wards, we might see, unfortunately, an increase in falls because people are more mobile. So, again, it's a very difficult variable to try and maybe justify what we're doing, but it does show how more we are delving into those harm free care metrics to see whether this is having more of a wider benefit on that patient journey. From an operational perspective, you know, and, and to, you know, to submit the information to our site management team to understand what the patient flow element looks like, we've seen a massive increase in less than seven day length of stay on the specific wards. We've seen a significant reduction in 21 plus length of stay. And on average, patients um, who are working with the ward led enablement team or working with the ward led enablement team and then go through the rapid discharge process have a significantly less um, average length of stay or ward or spell, sorry, throughout their whole journey in comparison to the ward average. So there is some real definitive differences here in in not just in the, the ability to get patients up and mobile, but how as a collaborative health and social care, um, yeah, I said collaborative, but collaboration as it were, has been really effective. But you know, commonly we, we were asked lots of questions around this, especially around culture. Now I've done quite a bit of work in locally within the trust, building on the fantastic work that ECIS has been doing, Brian Dolan, Dr. Amit Aurora, Anne Marie Riley up in the north to understand, you know, what that transition or what how we can really embed a complete change or business as usual in the NHS. And it's really difficult to define, to be honest, because there's so many arms to it. And I think we've explored a significant amount and we're just still scratching the surface. But things like how do the therapists feel with um, the wonderful ECL team on the wards? Did it affect their role? Did it affect their their confidence, their competence in feeling what their job was? Because me as a, as a physio by trade, you know, this is my bread and butter. This is what I love to do, but I don't have the time to physically do this on the wards because there's so many other elements that we're trying to support, whether it's the acutely unwell patient, all those complex discharges, that bit in the middle, that really important bit of re -ablement. Sometimes it's not that we intentionally miss it but we just don't have the capacity to do so and I think the beauty of having ring fence staff to do so has been brilliant I mean the therapists love it they, they collaborate um, pre-board rounds for example or during board round discussions to really identify the right patients yes some more complex assessments need to be conducted by our physio or occupational therapists but if the patient has been seen for example by our admissions teams or at the front door and a clear plans there the ward and neighborhood team the ladies in red just get stuck straight in that we need to sort of try to demystify and reduce this red tape, as it were, around actually, you know, this patient has been admitted, but they were walking around their own home a day or two ago. Nothing should significantly change. Yes, the the, the psychosomatic element, the, the physiological element does impact quite quickly, but conversely, we probably also make it more difficult based on the governance and everything else that we do around the trust. So, you know, it, it's just really about visibility and communication, to be honest. Skill mixing has been fantastic as well. So really getting the ward led enablement team to work with our nursing colleagues, so our healthcare assistants, to work with our therapy assistants. That cross learning, that peer learning environment, it, you can see it. Again, trying to capture that's difficult unless we say, right, we do a pre and post survey after every interaction with colleagues. Or, you know, the fact that they're sharing, well, this is how we do it in the community. Or, well, this is what we do in the ward environment. You get this really nice sort of meeting in the middle, as it were. The MT has learnt so much. They also are embracing the element of home first. So, you know, a lot of our colleagues who are ladies in red who have worked in the community, they would have seen a lot of these patients 
from Absolutely. hospital, you know, they see that transition, don't they? So what they can see is actually, you know, I know they might be in hospital gown, hopefully not, obviously, and hopefully dressed in their own clothes and up. Um, but they might say, well, this person, yes, they might look quite frail now, but actually when they're at home, they're a completely different person. So we've done a lot of training around embracing risk within the realms that's appropriate within health and social care, of course, but also, you know, trying to not think that word that's safe, that safe is kind of a bad word, isn't it, at the acute at the moment? And just really thinking, actually, you know, let's really just promote their independence because that enables them just to get home quickly so yeah but anyway it does lead me on to the next without me obviously going into too much information but has there been or have your team noticed an impact to the patient's journey on discharge and what you see from an operational perspective i suppose in the community with what you have to manage on a day-to-day basis with reablement yeah, absolutely. I mean, as you say, the staff, the rehabilitation staff that are now on the ward, were rehabilitation staff in the community. So they um, have a different view as to the risks that individuals take when they live alone or live with family members um, and how to navigate their way around a home rather than in the hospital environment. Because a ward is all flat, uh, nice, wide, open doors, lovely, open, wide corridors, whereas people's homes aren't like that. Um, And something that we've been doing as part of this programme is, as you mentioned, the ladies in red, as our ECL staff are known, they build up a trust with the person. They have that conversation about going home. How do you do this at home? What is your home like? And they start this idea within the person's mind, even as an inpatient, that actually I am going to go home. I am going to sort this out. I've got to do it myself. And it becomes more of a um, conversation and a mindset shift for the patient themselves. And then what we've seen, we've um, actually been involved in the first 12 months with um, over 500 discharges um, across the two wards that we support. Um, And 240 of those actually came home with the Reablement Service. So we've been able to track their journeys and we're able to gather feedback directly from the patient and their loved ones. And many people overwhelmingly have said how their discharge, if they've been in hospital before this time, has actually felt better because they've had the ladies in red on the ward. They've built up that trust and that confidence that I can do this and then when they get home our ladies in red turn up again different faces different people but same uniform and that that automatically gives them trust and confidence that I can do this when I get home the rapid response um, pathway that we've set up for referrals out of the Woodled Enablement Programme into the ECL Community Reablement Service um, actually captures the goals that they've been working on on the ward so that they're able to continue their journey that they've started while still a, a patient within ESNEFT out into their home so that they can see the progress they've already made and continue to make progress when they are out in the community. Um, We have had amazing results in people um, having successful discharges. In the first four months, not a single person didn't um, that was planned to leave on a reablement journey. They all did leave on a reablement journey. Um, We also have had um, a significant shift in the data towards pathway zero and one and away from pathway two in the level of discharges that have happened throughout the uh, 12 month period that we've been active again in the hospital. Um, And of those individuals that have come out with us, 40% of them have ended their service without any ongoing care need at all. And those that did require an ongoing care need, it was dramatically reduced. Um, And on average, it was reduced by 11 hours per person. That's an incredible amount of hours that is not um, being reliant on the social care system moving forward through having the intervention earlier whilst they are still a patient and reducing their deconditioning. Um, Something else is tracking the stories of people we um had a the very first customer we ever actually supported uh uh, roy um he's a wonderful gentleman he's a 80 something year old man who was cycling many many miles 20 30 miles a day um prior to having a neurological condition that um ended up losing his mobility entirely we started on the ward and two days afterwards we started working with roy um he actually was non-weight bearing he was a wheelchair user around the ward um he wanted to get back to the life he had and thought that that was going to be an impossible task. But we started with small steps. Um, we worked with him for the last two weeks of his hospital stay um, and he went home with us on a rehabilitation service. Um, we supported him to be able to walk. He was walking with a frame. Um, and as the service went on, he was then back on a exercise bike within his own home, being able to start cycling again. Um, and one year on, he is still 
hasn't returned to hospital um, and he is now back out cycling in the community, back out on his bike and he is fully independent once again. Um, so it's stories like that and the processes that people have, the impact it's had on their lives. There's countless, countless amounts of examples we could share. It's, in, it's incredible. And like I said, I've, I've also been very privileged to meet Roy. And if there's ever been any sort of difficulties or struggles, as we know, which most trusts and yourself will see on a day to day basis, looking at these figures, as it were, but or just even just thinking about Roy, who literally was our initial patient, mm. you know, is now our and obviously he's happy for us to share this information you know as a significant case study that contributes towards the success of this I mean th this proves it Roy actually had a significant length of stay prior to the team starting but it'd been really great a way to maybe capture what the difference would have been you know had, was that impact reduced length of stay significantly I, I'd, I'd say yes from a subjective perspective you know with the intervention with the the red ladies in red supporting him but there's another thing I also wanted to talk about was the the goals element and I think this is something that's always quite understated but I know that your your team are so good at writing goals for therapists it's, it's also our you know our way of doing things a joint set goal with the patient helps to inspire them motivate them something to work towards you know this, under the SMART acronym and I think having that continuity of goals into the community as well just inspires that patient more so and then when they see they're achieving more you know it it's just yeah, we, we could obviously talk about these things at no end, but, you know, there's a lot of positives here, but there's also on reflection and us really going through a true cycle of improvement and, you know, PDSA type cycles. There, there's a lot of things I suppose we could have done differently. But again, I think that's the beauty that we've had the time to learn from things that we've done and from the experiences. Um, to me, a question I suppose I'm going to throw to you, like, is there any specific lesson, Debbie, you've learned from this experience or what we're doing so far? Absolutely. I think one of the main things actually is having the dedicated staff team within the actual ward itself that is specific for the sole focus of reablement. You know, we started um, our wards October 2022. The NHS obviously um, has a lot of staffing issues at times and the fact that these individuals are actually focused purely on that uh, ward led enablement program means they don't get absorbed into the other nursing requirements or duties yeah, um, yeah. they are not in absorbed into the therapy element either we have very clear boundaries as to what they will do and, and can't do and it doesn't overstep what we do already in the community yeah. so our staff are reablement trained staff and they are individuals that are set just with the reablement ethos it is a mindset it is a process of changing people's thoughts about how to do things um, and moving away from the medical model it's actually the reablement model um, and I think that has been a, a real benefit to this program. Yeah I mean again saying that a lot of well we know the evidence base talks around activity you know when we talk about preventative healthcare measures we need to be active we need to eat slightly healthier we need to do x y and z so we're just basically extracting that yes it might be a little bit later down the line but we're just extracting that in an earlier reagent model which incorporates a significant lifestyle change as well so you know again it just points to the fact that there's a lot of things here that we're probably missing that's really good you know qualitative data as well but you know and and just going back to the point i've said and, and what you've identified about having staff that are solely protected there's less red tape around that it's it's purely just to do that and again i think because the way the, the healthcare system has evolved in recent years and the pressures we've all been under we have had to work differently and expand our roles and what this is doing is actually coming back to that core element I suppose and you know really holding down to the nuts and bolts of it but yeah no it, it, just fantastic and again just to, to reflect back on is that what I've learned is that you know maybe my evolve or my development as a professional within this element of, of health and social care is that you know things aren't always a linear process We've learned a lot through stages. We've, you know, nipped any issues in the bud quite early. We've, we've learned from that. We've brought the teams together. We've always discussed open and honestly about things. And I think that's another element of having that collaboration and those open discussions has been quite important. Um, Absolutely. Partnership working, I think, has been very key. We were welcomed into the wards. Yeah. It's been um, a joint process in the ethos as well, which I think has been wonderful. And we've seen those developments um, yeah. show across the whole ward, not just the individuals that the WLE team work with.
Yeah, and again, the, all four of the older persons wards that we have here at Colchester, there has been a difference. Like, for example, the up and dressed audit is now on all four of those wards. So they're tracking that. We've got another ward is doing exceptionally well in their performance metrics as such, with the ward clerk really steering the completion of that audit and getting the nursing teams to work with each other, compete in a, obviously a healthy and, you know, loosely termed safe way. So, you know, it, it, there is this spread. It, it takes time and that's the other element and the training education. But if you have some underlying governance of what I've noticed, some structure to it that allows it to evolve further um i mean like talking about evolving of the program before we finish up you know this program has led to other things like we've now created a bi dashboard for readmission data so capture themes based on one of the metrics from the service specification we developed you know so now we can actually cover the whole hospital looking at okay is there themes of why patients are coming back in and how we can support their appropriate journey you know other things as well like the rapid discharge referral process having that clear communication between the ward and the community to get that quick turnaround it links into the criteria to reside so when that patient is medically optimized for discharge we get them home sooner they're not there any later than they should be but it's just been it's been fantastic it's been fantastic to work with you it's been fantastic to draw and i hate to drop big policy but when you consider the nhs long-term plan this is exactly what it talks about it's that health and social care collaboration and you know i really think we're, we're we're just on the cusp really of other things and we just hope that we can develop a model i suppose that could stretch far and wide it's not always going to be a copy and paste it's every trust works differently every social care and works different but conversely there's a lot of foundation here that i think could be applied as a say for example an early intervention real model rather than us being reactive as we have done since covid being now more proactive in how we support our patients journey in our care absolutely but, yeah. we've been quite fortunate in the fact we've been able to you know prove the test that we started off in 2020 here in Colchester and it's been adopted around other hospitals across Essex um, so we're in all uh, major acute hospitals across Essex now doing the same program um, as well as now into um, Queen's in Havering as well so it's got the opportunity of being a model that others can adopt like you say not necessarily lift and shift because every trust and hospital will operate slightly differently but it's the ethos. Pinch with pride I think is the best term isn't it we can use that yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Well, um, I mean, I think we'll bring things to a close then, but um, we're obviously thank happy you, to no, thank you very much. Like we're happy to for colleagues across the um, health and social care family to reach out to us if they've got any further questions. We've already had some great interaction with Trust locally, haven't we, and some visits. And that's been fantastic to also share and learn from them as well what they're doing. So. At the end of the day, this is how we should be working across the board more collaboratively. But like I say, it's been fantastic, Debbie. I'm, I'm greatly appreciative of the, of the work that you've helped support and, you know, and more specifically what the ladies in red have been doing and the sheer contribution they are making to patients' lives. So thank you very much for your time today. Um, thank you. And hopefully we look forward to maybe updating um, colleagues um, from the podcasts in the future. So thank you very Absolutely. much. Thanks. Thank you.